afternoon. Welcome to our December State Board meeting. Mr. Walters, will you start our meeting by leading us in the pledge? This man will stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Our first item of business is the approval of the State Board of Education minutes for November 16th. Is there any objection to approving those minutes as they've been presented? Hearing none, those minutes are approved by unanimous consent. Is there any objection to approving the agenda today as presented? Hearing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. We have a few visitors and news media representatives with us today. If you can wave at us when we call your name. We have Mary Greer with WIS. Welcome. Um, Elizabeth Hanna with Pearson. Thank you. And then we have three people who have requested to speak. Jill Tyner with the South Carolina Association of School Librarians. Welcome. Catherine Malmquist, also with the South Carolina Association of School Librarians. And Dr. Gary Burgess, who's here from Florence 4. Welcome. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of you who are in attendance today, and especially to those who have uh, joined in our conversations later in the meeting. We have a few presentations that we need to make um, to our board members who have finished their terms of service. I think the best thing to do is to come this way so that we can get some pictures of you. And uh, the first person that we need to recognize is not here with us today. I haven't seen him. That's John Bootson. He represents the first judicial district. He's been with us since January 18th of 2018. And um, his term of service really ends at the end of this month. However, he has resigned. And his service time was three years and 11 months. So thank you to Mr. Bootson. <laughs> Our next member, Dr. J.R. Green, is from the Sixth Judicial Circuit. He served since January 18, 2018, till the end of this month, making his service three years and 11 months. Dr. Cynthia Downs from the 8th Judicial Circuit served since June 29, 2017 till the end of this month, making her service four years and six months. And our fourth member, Jean Pearson from the 12th Judicial Circuit, served since July 10, 2018. She finishes her term this month, making her service three years and five months. Thank you to all our friends on the board for your faithful service. Now, Madam Chair, don't sit down. Right. We've got a presentation for you to make. <laughs> or receive, I should say. I'm going to make it, and you're going to receive it. Okay. <laughs> this is the highly coveted gavel that you get when your term oh, runs right. out as chair of the state board. It's been an honor of all of us to serve under your leadership this year. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. Here, here.
Thank you so much. I truly have enjoyed my year of service. I've learned a lot very quickly from all of you, so thank you for your patience and for all the things that I've learned about how our meetings work, and especially during COVID and virtual meetings and pause time that so many of you had to remind me is important when people are at a distance. But thank you so much, and I'm very honored to have served. Thank you. And now... We will call on our State Superintendent of Education for your report. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and a special thank you to uh, Ms. Pearson. Thank you for your service. Dr. Green, always wonderful to work with you. And Dr. Woodall, thank you. Ms. Down, Dr. Downs, thank you uh, for being such devoted members. And I hope Mr. Bootson is listening in. Um, I appreciate his service as well, and um, anyone who dedicates their life to public service uh, is very special in my eyes, so thank you all for, for your work. You. I've enjoyed working with all of you. Um, so today, I'd like to give you an update on a few things that have happened since last month. On November the 30th, the Center for Education Recruitment, Retention, and Advancement, SARA, as we know it, released its annual Educator Supply and Demand Report. The SARA report shows that while the state's teaching workforce grew by 1,200 full-time employees this past year, districts had over 1,000 vacancies at the start of the school year. This is a 52% increase compared to last year's vacancies, and the largest number of vacancies reported by districts since the report began in 2001. So it's very concerning. The SDE is investing a portion of our agency set aside from the American Rescue Plan's Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER, to, to give and support proven educator recruitment and preparation programs including the South Carolina Teaching Fellows Program, Call Me Mr. Teach.org, and others that we are negotiating with at this time. We're also using federal funding to support school and district leaders to build expertise and best practices for recruiting, retaining, and developing high-quality teachers. I've just been over at the um, USC board meeting this morning, and and we had a discussion there even about teacher recruitment. And we're doing everything that we can think of uh, to support this issue, uh, to enhance the teaching workforce, and to entice more people to go into teaching. If you have extra ideas, uh, see me. But we're trying everything we can think of to, to help with this issue because we all know that we have to have quality teachers in the classroom to meet the needs of our students. Prior to the start of the 22 legislative session, we submitted a budget request to the General Assembly that includes a $162 million increase in teacher salary for the 22-23 fiscal year. This amount includes an adjustment to the salary schedule step levels for one to five years and a 2% across the board pay increase for teachers. In addition to salary increases, the agency supports legislative actions frequently cited by educators as the barriers for them to enter and stay in the profession such as providing teachers with protected, unencumbered planning time to dedicate to non-instructional tasks, to increase the teacher supply supplement amount available to teachers, funding the National Board Certification Salary Supplement, providing step increases all the way through the 28 years of service, and continuing to allow retired educators who return to covered employment employment in the K-12 public education system for them to be hired and earn up to $50,000 without impacting their monthly retirement allow allowance. So those are just a few of the things that we're working with the legislature on. And as I said earlier, any, any great ideas, we're very open to those. On November 22nd, 2021, we announced a partnership with South Carolina State Library to assist students and families who had been academically impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. Tutor.com 
is available for families 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Students will have access to high quality tutors, and these are real life people, over the internet in over 200 subject areas. In addition to individual tutoring, Tutor.com provides a service for administering practice tests to determine if students are on the trajectory for content mastery, as well as submit writing assignments for review and feedback. In addition to improving grades, tutors of Tutor.com assist with time management and planning strategies. So this is a wonderful, wonderful resource available during the day, as I said, 24 hours a day. So teachers can use this in the classroom with their students, as well as parents use it when, when, the, when the child comes home. High dosage tutoring, and that's a term that Dr. Mathis has taught me about, is a proven strategy to assist both students performing on grade level who need additional assistance and those who are having academic difficulty and are at risk of not meeting on-time graduation services. So this is a, a new resource that we're advertising out to all of our teachers, uh, our superintendents, instructional leaders, and parents to make sure that uh, they know it's there and that they use it. We had a really fun day uh, a few weeks ago, and then I, as we interviewed uh, the finalists for the South uh, for the United States Senate Youth Program, and then just a, a few days ago, I was able to call these two young men and congratulate them on being selected as our two winners, two recipients of our. our representing our high schools and selected as delegates to the 60th annual United States Senate Youth Program, USSYP, that will be held March the 5th through the 10th in Washington. Well, actually it's going on in Washington, but as of now it will be virtual. Each of these delegates will receive a $10,000 undergraduate college scholarship. So you can imagine it was an early Christmas present to them and to their families. This is a very, very competitive merit-based program. It brings 104 of the most outstanding high school students two from each state and the District of Columbia and the Department of Defense uh, Education Activity to the District of Columbia for an intensive week-long study of the federal government. They will hear major policy addresses by senators, United States senators, cabinet members, officials from the Department of State and Defense, and directors of other federal agencies. So congratulations to these two young men, Adi Bott. Adi is there on your left. He is the son of Sunita and Hermione Bott of Greenville, South Carolina. He's a senior at J.L. Mann High School. He is involved in speech and debate, youth and government, and is also a member of the varsity tennis program and is just a wonderful young man. I enjoyed talking with him so much. Emmett O'Brien is the son of Elizabeth and Joe O'Brien of Beaufort, South Carolina. And he's a senior at Buford High School and serves as a senior class president, a publicist for the French National Honor Society, and was selected as one of our two senators to represent South Carolina at Boys Nation this past summer in D.C. So congratulations to them, their school districts, all the teachers who had a part, and certainly to their families for um, just having really raised two outstanding young men. J-R-O-T-C coding. Last week I had a chance to go out to Richland One and Columbia High School. Governor McMaster joined me there. And we celebrated co uh, Computer Science Coding Week uh, with the students. And, and this school was selected because Columbia High School is one of 30 schools in the nation that was selected for this military cyber security pilot program. We were so impressed by the young people involved in the JROTC and uh, their discipline, their, their involvement in computer science, and um, it was just a thrill to be out there. And it's, I'm happy to tell you that South Carolina is tied with Arkansas as the two top states in the nation in computer for our delivery of computer science to our high schools. 92% of our high schools in South Carolina offer computer science, and we go on with a whole list of activities that we must show in computer science, including 
requiring computer science for graduation, having a director of computer science here at the Department of Education. So we're really thrilled with the progress we've made there and hats off to Richland One and those students for the work that they're doing. So that completes my report today. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions for Superintendent Spearman? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Parliamentarian comments. Ms. Hazelwood. Thank you. Um, just one comment, that if you um, do not want to serve at the conclusion of your term, um, you must resign. Until such time as your replacement is named, Mr. Whittemore could explain this process <laughs> to you, you continue to serve un until you officially resign or have a new member appointed. And we can tell you that sometimes that new appointment comes up the day before the next meeting. So you're on the, it, it's up to you, but just know that you have a requirement to officially resign. And if you don't resign, you're on the board, continue on the board, and you continue with the obligations of uh, filing your annual statement of economic interest, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about this every time until all of you are replaced. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're not in any hurry. <laughs> We have three people who have signed up for public comments. Um, we certainly appreciate your interest in public education, and we have five minutes for you to speak, but please remember these are comments we're hearing for the first time, so we won't be answering today. We just are interested in hearing your thoughts. So our first person is Jill Tyner with South Carolina's Association of School Librarians. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jill Tyner. I am an elementary school librarian, and I serve as the chairperson for the Intellectual Freedom Committee of the South Carolina Association of School Librarians. I'm the proud parent of two teenagers in public schools, and I myself am a product of South Carolina public schools. South Carolina school librarians are professional educators with master's level degrees or higher, trained in selecting materials to meet the needs of a broad community of students. We select books based on a variety of factors, including age relevance, professional reviews, support of the curriculum, and the needs and wants of students and staff in our schools. School districts have reconsideration policies and procedures in place for constituents to request review of specific materials, although these do vary by district. I'm speaking today in support of the model library materials policy that you will see from Superintendent Spearman. I was pleased that Superintendent Spearman took the initiative to include librarians from our association in drafting this policy, and I'm proud to have been a part of that process. Our meetings and correspondence with Superintendent Spearman and her office have been extremely productive and collaborative, and have provided a wonderful example of how policymakers and people on the ground can work together to do what's best for children. Sadly, we've seen a wave of efforts to censor books in school libraries across our country in recent months. We recognize that not every book is right for every reader. Parents have the right to set reading parameters and restrictions for their own children. However, no one person or group has the right to make choices for other children. Like Superintendent Spearman, we believe it's imperative that the policies and procedures for the reconsideration of library materials be followed each and every time a request is made to remove a book or library material. We agree that no one person or group at the state or district level should be allowed to circumvent the process and remove materials without following procedures. One of the reasons I chose this line of work is to make a difference in the lives of children through reading, which is what sustained me through my years as a young person in South Carolina. I thank you for making reading and libraries a priority in our state and in our schools, and I hope you'll continue to protect our students in all ways, including the right to read. I and the South Carolina Association of School Librarians are here to help and be a partner in this effort. I appreciate all your work, and I wish you the happiest of holidays. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Catherine Malmquist, also with South Carolina's Association of School Librarians. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Malmquist. I am an elementary librarian, and I am the current president of the South Carolina Association of School Librarians, also known as SCASL. I just first want to thank you for your service to our state and its children. I also want to thank Molly Spearman and her office for their work and dedication to our children. 
I have been impressed by their thoroughness and research and willingness to work with school librarians during this time and not hesitating to reach out to us. SCASL really appreciates the opportunity to directly work with you and that this has been a team effort. Today, I want to focus on the needs of our schools and how they differ within school districts. As you know, as public educators, we educate all students who come to us. As a librarian, my job is to know the needs of my school community and find materials that are relevant to our students. When I joined my school in 2013, I realized the need for Spanish English bilingual books as well as more Spanish text. While the majority of my collection is still English and we encourage students to pick text written in English, I am able to offer our students books they can read with their families in Spanish. These books can also offer comfort to students who are learning a new language, but still want the opportunity to read for enjoyment. This also helps our students in their college and career preparedness as they are refining a skill which will increase their opportunities in the job market. These books are not necessary in all libraries in my district. They are specifically chosen based on the needs and wants of my students and teachers. I try to be very strategic with my book budget to ensure I am purchasing books my school will use, as well as purchasing as many materials as possible. And using a list given to me by another school does not ensure my school's needs are being met. Every year, we increase our book collection, and the goal is that every child is able to see themselves in a book in our library. Students are thrilled to find books with characters that look like themselves or their friends and cannot wait to share them. I treasure the book joy moments because it shows we are building readers, and readers are leaders. When my students walk into the library, I want them to feel like they belong. I want them to find themselves in a book. And I want them to know that even if they feel different, they are still valued. When we censor books, when we take away their value in the collection, we are telling our students we do not value them. I want my students to know that I believe in them and that I see their value in our society. With that, I encourage you to allow books to remain in circulation while they are going through the challenge processes. School librarians are educated individuals who use a variety of resources when curating their collection. At the end of the day, we want what is best for our students and school. Again, we appreciate your time in reviewing this matter and allowing school librarians to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And now Dr. Gary Burgess from Florence Four. I'd like to take part of the time allocated for the slot I signed up for to impart a moment of silence in remembering the victims, survivors, and their families of the devastating tornadoes that decimated the mid-central western part of our nation this weekend. I moderated my comments I would make today, understanding that we are all mere mortals held to a higher power. A moment, please. Chairperson, Dr. Widow, members of the Board of Education, the Honorable State Superintendent Molly Spearman, and staff, I'm Gary L. Burgess, Senior Spokesperson for the Florence County School District 4 Board of Trustees. Thank you for allowing me to speak during public comment today. As you know, under South Carolina law, the control of public instruction is vested in you, the State Board of Education. The State Superintendent, Superintendent Spearman, is charged with general supervision of education in this state. I have a series of questions. What would you do if an officer of the state canceled a lawful election in your school district? What would you do if an officer of the state created a consolidation transition committee with elected officials on that committee from, other, from the other district, but not elected officials from your district. What would you do if an officer of the state were attempting to consolidate your district with a district that had made no plans to consolidate, but to absorb your district? What would you do if an elected officer of the state communicated with your children about closing their high school and not the parents, guardians, or other adults elected to represent the children and the people of your district? What would you do 
if an officer of the state met with your children without your permission to try to persuade them that it would be best if their school were closed and they were bused to another school? What would you do if an officer of the state proposed to place your children on buses and bus each day to schools on a round trip that would take approximately four to five hours a day? What would you do if an officer of the state sold property that belonged to the people of your district held in trust by the board, your board, without consulting the rightful owners of the property or holding a referendum? What would you do if an officer of the state conspired with a local district to drain your district of its students. What would you do if an officer of the state attempted through a hostile takeover to forcefully consolidate your district with a district where violence is surging? What would you do if an officer of the state in charge of your schools did not provide an SRO for the schools? What would you do if an officer of the state through a hostile takeover was systematically dismantling your school and your district program by program department by department. What would you do if an officer of the state used their influence to deceptively convince your school board that they were no longer a legal entity? What would you do if an officer of the state unlawfully dismissed your school board, took over the operations of your school, uh, not, and not hold monthly meetings with the members of your public? What would you do if an officer of the state held the funds of your school board so that the school board could not defend itself? What would you do if an officer of the state, under the taxing authority of the state for school districts, levy taxes in your district without holding public hearings? What would you do if an officer of the state told your community that they would work to improve the operations of your district while all the time appearing to drain your district of its resources, human, and material to enrich others? What would you do if the State Board of Education and an officer of the state treated the children, citizens, of your district and you like second class citizens, like chattel, like property. I know what you would do. You would fight with all the energy you have. You would fight with every fiber of your being, blood, sweat, tears to save your children, your school, your school district, your town, your legacy. The people of Timminsville, Florence, School District 4 will do no less. I must believe in my heart after seeing the utter devastation in the Midwest that this board and the two superintendents, Spearman, do not mean the children and the people of Timminsville harm. Nonetheless, your actions have caused harm. It is not too late to mitigate their harm and stop what is taking place and use the vast resources of the state to make Florence for whole. It will not matter in the end if we are on the right side of history. What will matter is if we are on the right side of providence. Each of us are walking through the valley and the shadow of death, and some of us are in the very clutches of death. We'll be held to account for how we treated the least of our brothers and sisters. Stop the damage. Isn't it strange how captains and kings and clowns who frolic and saw this ranks and common folk board and superintendent spearmen like you and me, we all are the builders of eternity. Teachers given a bag of clay, a lump of clay, the bag of rules to build a time has flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. I urge this board, I urge the state superintendent to be stepping stones not stumbling blocks, stepping stones of local control and home rule. Stop the dictatorial, heavy-handed destruction of Florence Ford. Return the district to the people and allow the people to decide their future. Thank you. Chairman Woodall, who may I leave this notebook with? May I give it to? Can you give it to our parliamentarian? To, uh, then you don't uh, have yes. to walk anywhere. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Burgess. Thank you. In our committee reports this morning, our policy and legislative committee did not meet, but our educator professions committee did, and I recognize Ms. Pearson to present the highlights from that committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. The education professional committee uh, approved four action items this morning. EP01, South Carolina Educator Preparation Guidelines, Standards, Policies, and Procedures, Specialty Area Programs Approved Standards. EP02, State Accreditation Decisions, Columbia International University. EP03, Approval of Out-of-State Clinical Experience Placement, Winthrop University. And EP04, Educators Preparation Program Modification, College of Charleston. The committee did not hear any, act, any information items, and all four items were placed on the consent agenda. Thank you so much. Report. 
Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Pearson? Ms. Stapleton, would you share with us the highlights from the Standards Learning and Accountability Committee? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. This morning, there were two action items presented to the Standards Learning and Accountability Committee, and I'm going to give you a little bit of information about both of those. The first was a report of recommendations from the 2021 Instructional Materials Review, review Panels. Ms. Chris Stewart, Program Coordinator for the Instructional Materials Adoption Program, gave an overview of the Instructional Materials Adoption Process before the report of the review panel recommendations was presented. She explained that it's a year-long process. Instructional materials are reviewed and adopted on a staggered six-year cycle by subject area. Ms. Stewart went over the timeline, recommendations, and approval process. One of the recommendations are the subject areas that will have new materials for the upcoming school year. She reported on the process of the call for bid and for establishing the review panels of candidates submitted by the State Board of Education, District Superintendents, Instructional Leaders, and South Carolina Department of Education Specialists. Publishers that are bidding for the year provide print and digital samples of their materials for the review process. Then Dr. Mathis provided some additional background information. Pursuant to South Carolina Code of Laws, Section 5931.610 and State Board of Education Regulation 4370, the State Superintendent of Education and the South Carolina Department of Education staff arranged for a 30-day public review of materials recommended by the Instructional Materials Review Panels. The instructional materials were accessible in person at 15 colleges and universities located across the state, as well as digitally through links provided from all publishers and available on the South Carolina Department of Education website. A public feedback form was utilized to gather input from South Carolinians who inspected the materials both online and in person. Dr. Mathis reported the methods the public was made aware of and the process which invited feedback. <clears throat> The South Carolina Department of Education received 237 public com comments, the majority of which centered on the science and social studies text. Career and technical education materials received the least amount of public feedback. Based on the South Carolina Department of Education staff's review of the instructional materials, they recommend that the State Board of Education approve all career and technical education instructional materials and all science instructional materials with the exception of anatomy and physiology. The South Carolina Department of Education recommends and asks that the State Board of Education allow the State Department staff to further review social studies instructional materials and the anatomy and physiology texts and work with publishers as needed on edits suggested by internal content experts and guided by the public feedback. And the State Department has said they will work as quickly as possible so that those materials can move forward for adoption at an early 2022 meeting of the State Board. So item SLA01 was approved by our committee and placed on the consent agenda. Agenda. Ms. Stewart also um, presented the report of recommendations from the Instructional Materials Advisory Committee for the 2022 adoption cycle and the recommendations to fill committee vacancies. And with that, she reported on four recommendations. One, the subject areas that will have new materials adopted in 2022. Two, the prioritized order for purchasing new and unfunded materials for the upcoming school year. Three, the options to extend or renegotiate expiring contracts. And four, the 2022 Instructional Materials Adoption Calendar of Events. This was SLA 02, and it was also placed on the consent agenda and approved by the committee. So both of those items are part of our consent agenda today. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Mr. Kabrowski. Thank the staff for their decision to kind of put it off for a, a while for further review and thank them for that and review what's at stake. And I would hope that I just wanted to make a brief comment to ask the board members to take the time uh, to go to one of those 15 college and university sites around the state to look at the textbooks because for public education, one of the most important things we do and now that people don't have newspapers as much as they used to, unfortunately, and they get their news just online, uh, for a lot of students, this is how they'll get their view of what it is to be an American and uh, what our country's about. And I know there's 17 of us, and we all have different views, but you know the textbooks are not the textbooks of our parent generations or that we have. We recently saw the passing of Bob Dole and the 
views of the greatest generation, you know, take the time also to look on the textbooks when you read them, who the people are who wrote them and the reviewers. You see most of them are from American studies professors or and that kind of thing, or anything but. And I noticed that the, um, this as an, a, a brief example of the one I did and why we all um, need to look and take the time to to do it. And they're talking about World War II and about the, and this is show the biases that come in. They were talking about who the Nazis were and the fascists. And they said they believed in traditional gender roles. I don't, you know, know what that had to do with the Nazis. I mean, certainly speaking as a Jew and, and of the six women most most believed in traditional gender roles. I mean, that was something that was not uh, just germane to fascism. And th these are things that so the and other people pick up different things too. So I ask all of us to look at the collective wisdom of the state to see and to scrutinize it. And the collective wisdom, people will see different things and and bring their own perspectives to the table. So I, I see this as one of the most important things that we do. Again, I want to thank the staff for taking a pause and allowing us that chance. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grabowski. Dr. Green. Yes, um, I, I, I'm probably like most of you, uh, spent some time reading the comments. Uh, I'm passing the mic over so the public can hear you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I did probably, like most of you, spend some time reviewing the comments to the proposed uh, text that were up for adoption. Uh, in full disclosure, I did not spend time going through all the text, but one thing that concerns me is there appears to be a, uh, a, a recurring theme uh, on the social studies text uh, that people want to avoid some of the stains of this country and this state uh, relative to our history around race, um, and and I want to you know I, I saw the term race baiting and uh, and issues that divide us and not focus on things that divide us, uh, but the history is the history, uh, and in any attempt uh, to ignore the history uh, with the goal of somehow uh, bringing us together, uh, I think is a, a faulty proposition. You know, I, I, I read a book written by Richard Gogol called The Un, called Unexampled Courage, the, the Isaac Woodard story. And, and, uh, and, it, and ironically, he was from Fairfield County, World War II veteran who was, uh, was blinded in Batesburg, South Carolina. Uh, and it was very enjoyable, but it was very disappointing that I had never learned that history uh, in my 52 years. Uh, and the fact that a young person from Fairfield County would not know that history is, is very disappointing. Uh, and there's so much other history that I think uh, there are some who want us to try and avoid that simply we've not done a good job of really, really sharing. And I want to be sure that uh, we don't succumb to some of this public pressure uh, that wants to, uh, pardon my, my, my pun, but try and whitewash history and act as if certain things just simply did not occur. Okay, we have moved past a lot, okay? And, and we're all thankful for that. Uh, but the suggestion that we shouldn't focus and teach uh, true history, I'm not talking about uh, critical race theory or, or anything that, uh, that, that, that proposes to theorize uh, how the impact of race has affected uh, people of color. I'm talking about facts. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the, the fact that George Stinney uh, was executed. Uh, we, we, we're talking about uh, the Tulsa race massacre. Uh, we, we, we're talking about George Elmore. I mean, we're talking about things that actually occurred. And, and as I listened and I read the comments, I just want to be sure as we delay this adoption that, that, that we are asking publishers to somehow remove items that are documented historical facts in this nation and this state, okay? Uh, because that, that, that definitely concerns me. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Green. I'm sure Dr. Mathis will take that to heart in the reviews. And I too, did anybody else have any other comments? And I wanted to reiterate too um, how much I appreciate the public's commenting at all 
That's a big task, and that is a lot of reading, as both of you have just mentioned, especially in the social studies arena. So thank you to all of the people in our state who did read different sections of those books because it is impossible for us to read 30 or 40 plus supplementary documents that go with them. So thank you to all of you who took the time to do that. That was invaluable to us as we review. And now Superintendent Spearman. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, just, I too wanted to thank everyone, board members, uh, our parents, the public who have helped us review uh, the textbooks. You're right. It's one of the most important things that you do as a board. We're taking this very, very seriously and looking at all the comments and then going back and looking at the text. Uh, Dr. Green, I hear you and, and I agree. We need honest history. And I think the depart you'll find the department uh, is, very, is dedicated to that. Uh, even the story that you talked about, I, I grew up shopping in Batesburg. Uh, even had Batesburg Leesville in my house district when I was in the legislature and had never heard that story either. Uh, but it is on our African American history calendar that we produced. Uh, so there are, there are other attempts that we're making to bring history, all the facts of history and the appropriate um, recognition for folks who have played such an important part in our history. And uh, Mr. Kabrowski, I, I hear you clearly. Um, so we are, we're gonna do our best uh, to make sure that our history books are accurate history books, not just current event collections, <laughs> but that it is good history books. So thank you, and I appreciate the board assisting us. Um, we spent an awful lot of time over the last uh, few months on this. Chris Stewart and her folks and all of our offices were very involved uh, with, with this. So thank you for giving us a little extra time and we'll do our best to have a report back to you. But in no way do we intend to um, cover up any history. <laughs> we want it to be good, good factual history that's told accurately and um, in a way that will also help our students understand how what a great country we live in, even with its flaws, uh, still the greatest place to live. So thank you. Do we have any questions for Superintendent Spearman on those items? The only thing that came up, you reiterated this morning in committee about the timeline, and you said it again a minute ago, it will come at the beginning of 2022. So any other questions that surfaced? Thank you again. Uh, educator licensure, Mr. Walters, will you talk to us about the committee? Thank you, Madam Chair. The committee met this morning and considered eight cases. Uh, on those eight cases, seven of them were suspensions of certificates for unprofessional conduct for breach of contract, and one case was for unprofessional conduct. Those cases were ratified in the full board uh, license hearing committee meeting. Thank you so much. And then when the full board met, um, as he mentioned, we did ratify the committee's work. We heard one initial certification um, case that was approved, one initial certification that was denied, two order, one order of public reprimand, and two orders of suspension. So that was the full board committee's work this morning. And now we have a special committee report, if Mr. Kabrovsky's ready, well, thank um, you. to present next year's chair elect. Well, our 2000 or chair elect committee report, we met at the last meeting in person, we met today. Uh, again, to discuss the selection nominee for the 2022 chair-elect position. And we have elected by unanimous consent to present Chrissy Stapleton, the second judicial circuit, as the committee's nominee as our 2022 chair-elect. So we're honored to do that and we congratulate you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for your work, all three of you, Mr. Hensey, Mr. Kabrowski, you chaired, and Ms. Pearson. Thank you for recommending. Do we have anyone from the floor that needs to be considered? I think we're all nodding agreement with the committee. Um, so with no other recommendations, do we have a motion to make Ms. Stapleton our 22 chair elect? I so move. Dr. Downs, thank you so much. Do we have a second? Second. 
Second by Mr. Whittemore. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 I don't think we have any opposition most on those voices. Congratulations. <laughs> And now, if Mr. Walters and Ms. Stapleton will join me at the front, at the flag again, uh, for the oath of office. And I just do. So I'm going to start with our new chair for 2022. Doing a wonderful job for us. If you'll raise your right hand. I state your name. Alan Walters. Do solemnly swear that I will uphold the duties. Do solemnly swear that I will uphold the duties. And the laws of the state of South Carolina. And the laws of the state of South Carolina. Based on statutes governing operations. Based on statutes governing operations. Of the South Carolina State Board of Education. Of the South Carolina State Board of Education. Congratulations. All right, Ms. Stapleton. Fighting for my first official act to be able to swear you in. So, turn the page here. And if you'll repeat after me, I state your name. Chrissy Stapleton. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will uphold. The duties, and laws the duties and laws of the state of South Carolina, of the state of South Carolina based, on statutes, based on statutes governing operations, governing operations of, the South Carolina State Board of Education. of the South Carolina State Board of Education. Congratulations, <laughs> Madam Chair elect. Need the consent agenda. Yep, so at this point, I get to run the meeting for the balance of it, unless you just feel the urge. I, I feel very <laughs> comfortable with your leadership, Mr. Walters. Thank you very much. So the next item we have is the consent agenda. It was distributed to you, and at this time, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. And the motion carries. And now we've got some reports. And Dr. Mathis, you are up first. Mr. Walters, your first report. <laughs> How good is that? Literacy That's update. A good one. <laughs> in September, we reorganized the um, College and Career Readiness Division to combine the Office of Standards and Learning with the Office of Assessment. This created the Office of Assessment and Standards. The goal was to create a seamless approach to the development and delivery of content standards that align to the development of our summative assessments. At the same time, the Office of Curricular Innovation was created to provide resources that address the rigor and depth of the standards, as well as provide materials that provide a cohesive assessment system to include formative and interim assessments to prepare students for our summative state assessments. Currently, our English language art standards are being revised with an, an original timeline to present them to you for approval in spring of 2022. Through this re revision process, we have determined that additional time is needed to make, to make certain the standards are fewer in number, deeper in understanding, and prioritized in a continuum from grade level to grade level. In addition, the extension of the development of the, uh, the standards would ensure a quality assessment is developed with the appropriate content identified at each grade level. Our staff met with the Education Oversight Committee staff to discuss this process and have their full support. Our goal is to have the English Language Arts Standards to you for approval in fall of 2022. This will allow for further revision and development um, prior to uh, the standards being put out for public review and public comment. 
for final approval. That's my report. Any questions for Dr. Mathis? Thank you, sir. Next up is Katie Nilgis with an update on library material selections and best practices. I got your second report, so I'll, I'll, take, I'll take second. Um, good afternoon. Um, at last month's meeting, as you'll remember, Superintendent Spearman discussed with you the library materials um, and some issues that were coming up with library materials in some school districts. Um, you asked us to review current district policies, identify best practices, and then present a model policy for selection and reconsideration of library materials in schools. Um, since that time, um, we've done a bit of additional research, and we found a few antiquated laws from 1962 um, that were put on the books. One was a library committee that was established at the department. Um, the superintendent was to serve on it along with a, um, at the time it was called a high school supervisor and a director of elementary education. Um, since then, we've had reorganizations and obviously those exact um, positions do not exist anymore, but um, Superintendent Spearman does plan to reconvene that committee and um, have them help us through the process as we move forward with, um, with library books in schools. Um, also, um, one of the laws that we came across was about furnishing library books. Um, and we found that the department did publish some guidance in 1986 about some library books for districts. Included in that publication, there was the statement that each district should have a written policy for selection of library materials approved by their local board of trustees. So when we look at what's happened between 1962 and 1968, we have a few things that I just want to point out to kind of help you get some groundwork of where we've where we've come. The first is that, um, and when I appreciate my new librarian friends back there, um, they were not lying when I said I took a deep dive into some, some library research. Um, there's just three things I want to point out to help understand where we've come. The first is that in 1973, um, the College of Librarianship at USC had its first graduating class. Um, 1977, the Education Finance Act was passed, so that changed the way districts received funding. And then 1978, new certifications became available for librarians, which allowed them to be um, in districts and schools with that level of expertise that those schools and districts needed. Um, with that in mind, it's the recommendation of the department that the selection of materials should rest at that local level. Um, as they're the ones that are best equipped to make those appropriate decisions um, at their individual schools and districts. So on November 28th, Superintendent Spearman convened a meeting with the executive committees of the South Carolina Association for School Librarians. Um, and we discussed best practices and um, an attempt to better understand the processes that occur at local levels for selection of those materials. A few of them are here today and we heard from them earlier. And then you do have in your packets that I passed out um, a brief written comment from one of the other executive committee members that met with us that day. Um, so during that conversation, a few key points came out and best practices were discussed. Um, I want to talk about just three of them really briefly. The first is the importance of drawing that distinction between library books and instructional materials. So library books are those that are going to be funded by local dollars. They explain, you know, usually that's going to be your book fair money or any money that the local board establishes to go towards purchasing those library books. Instruction materials are funded by state dollars and they're aligned with state standards and assigned for instruction, whereas those library books are, um, they serve as options for students to choose. Librarians with their expertise and training understand the best needs for their school. And then another, or another best practice we talked about was the need for the policies to be widely known throughout the school and district um, discussed and then available to ensure that the processes within those policies are followed appropriately. So after we had discussions with the members from the Library, or Association of School Librarians, spoke with a few concerned parents and reviewed multiple district policies, we've included a model policy in your packet as well. 
So the goal for today is just to provide you some information on it. I won't read through the whole thing and bore you, but I will just hit some high points. Um, the first point is the school librarians shall use their professional training and expertise to evaluate the existing material and consult reputable and unbiased sources when selecting those materials. Um, so the list of items for consideration that you'll see in that policy include appropriateness for students in each grade or each school, so grade and age level, and then educational significance of that material as well. Um, it also goes into in the policy when there is a request for a material to be reconsidered. So a few things to point out there is that it's important that the complainant reside in either the school district that they're um, offering the complaint or they have a student who attends the school in which the district they're making that complaint. The complainant has read the material in full and can respond to all questions on the reconsideration form, which you also have a copy of the model form that um, we created as well. And then that a separate form must be completed for each material that they're asking to be reconsidered. Um, the, the model policy goes on to say that there should be a standing committee formed, whether that's at the district or school level, depending on the district size. Um, some districts are larger, so they may need that school size to help um, get to that district level. But other districts may just want to have a district-wide policy or standing committee. Um, we also have that there should be a 15-day review to issue the report, and during which time those books should be removed from circulation. And immediately upon the report, if it's deemed that the materials are to be appropriate, those materials should be placed back into circulation immediately. Um, we also included that local board shall establish an appeals process not to extend beyond 15 business days. And then once a decision has been reached, that there's a time period for that um, book to not be challenged again so that it's not continuing um, a cycle of challenging the same materials over and over again. Um, the last part is that we, we recommend the policy and form should be prominently displayed on the school and district websites and that the policies shall list all relevant policies that connect with the library material selection policy and that local boards shall periodically review and update this policy. Um, so I welcome any feedback you may have. If you want, I encourage you to go back to your districts, talk with the folks there, um, see how they feel about it, and then next month, we'll come back together and um, recommend a model policy for adoption for the state board. Will, will this be published on our website where people can access it? I, if they want to review or comment on it? We can, if you would like. Yeah, I just um, think it would be a good idea where it's accessible to folks. It would probably go on y'all's website, on right. y'all's? Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be part of the minutes anyway, right. so, right. right. Okay, any questions for Ms. Nilges? Okay, thank you very thank much. You. And next up with three items is Ms. Kimberly Mack with Allendale, Florence County School District 4, Williamsburg County School District updates. Good afternoon. I am very honored to come and bring some bright spots for our districts that we um, work with. In Allendale County School District, the Marquee Publication Board presented Superintendent Dr. Margaret Gilmore with the 2021-2022 Who's Who in America Award. Two Allendale Fairfax High School students, Danasia Johnson and Shamaya Shipman, have been awarded $1,000 scholarships. These students participated in the Central Savannah River Area College Night on November 4th, 2021. And the students who maintained a 2.5 GPA on a 4.0 scale or equivalent were eligible to win one of the 15 scholarships during the virtual event. In Florence School District 4, I'm happy to announce that they had a Career on Wheels um, event on November the 16th, 2021 for third through eighth grade students. And Dr. Patrick, one of Rock Rockington Elementary's coaches, started the Proficient Performers Program at the elementary school, securing several fifth grade volunteers to serve as mentors for Brockington Elementary's kindergarten students. 
One of their first assignments was to help kindergarten students learn how to fully spell and write out their whole names. Two of the 10 kindergarten students that they're working with have already accomplished um, learning how to write their full names. So their mentors are now beginning to work with them on learning sight words. It's a really powerful program, um, having students from the upper grade levels work with the kindergarten students. In Williamsburg County School District, Marco McGill, who was a graduate of King Street High School and a diplomat for the US State Department, made a Zoom career presentation to all three district high schools. And King Street High School's band was chosen as a top band in South Carolina State's South Carolina Band Day. This concludes my report. Do you have any questions for Ms. Mack? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will move on to other business. Uh, don't forget your travel forms if you haven't already turned them in. I have one item I want to bring up. It's really an information item for today. Uh, and certainly we've seen a lot in the headlines lately across our state with, with behavior issues, discipline issues, threats, uh, weapons, and such. And we all know about the terrible tragedy in Michigan. We also know that today is the ninth anniversary of Sandy Hook. And so I think it's an important time to bring our board members up to date on, on what we've been working on now for about a year and a half. We've been working on, if you remember from the Accelerate Ed report, one of the recommendations that our committee made was to have a South Carolina School Safety Center. And that would be an entity that would build upon the good work already being done by the State Department of Education and really take it to a new level. And so we've been working on that that whole year and a half. And good Lord willing, early 2022, we're going to have a formal announcement and have it up and running. So with all this going on, I thought it was important to share that with you today. And certainly someone who's in my job as a school district safety director, I can tell you the need is there for it. So with that, is there any other business, Madam Superintendent? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Walters, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. On our Center for School Safety, we have been in uh, many negotiations, meetings, and thanks to your leadership, uh, thankful that you're on the board with your background in law enforcement and that you're so willing to help us, and we're excited about it and hope to have an announcement very, very soon. Uh, I did want to mention and introduce, if you haven't met, but to let uh, our public know, uh, at last month's meeting, we discussed that the General Assembly had given us funding to hire two people to assist the state board. We were in the process then of hiring those, and they are with us today. Ms. Kinsey Riddle, Kinsey, if you'll stand up, and also Cricket Katzos, if you'll stand. These uh, two remarkable young women will be working and supporting the state board, and we're, we welcome you, and I'm sure that you all will get their cell phone numbers quickly if you don't already have them, but we look forward to uh, your group being supported and uh, transferring some of those activities uh, to their office. Thank, Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Welcome, ladies. We're delighted to have you. I'm sure Tracy's delighted as well, because uh, <laughs> we've had a lot placed on her plate here lately, too. So she'll be able to, to share that with you. With that, is there any other business to come before the board? Well, then we'll close the meeting out, wishing you all a safe and restful holiday season, and looking forward to a wonderful 2022, and being no other business, this meeting is adjourned.